the audience. Um, I believe we can start. But I, I only see one person. I wonder. I'm hearing an echo of myself. I'm sorry. Okay, are you hearing me okay? I'm hearing an echo of myself. I'm sorry. I'm hearing an echo of you also. Hmm. Okay, are you hearing me okay? I'm hearing an echo of myself. I'm sorry. Oh, oh dear. I'm hearing an echo of you also. Hmm. Okay, are you hearing me okay? Hearing an echo of myself. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm hearing that echo of you also. Hmm. Okay, are you hearing me okay? Hearing an echo of myself. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm hearing that echo of you also. Hmm. Okay, are you hearing me okay? Hearing an echo of myself. I'm hearing that echo of you also. Okay, hold everything. Okay, hold everything. How's that? No echo in, no echo now. So I think we're good. How's that? Oops. Do you want me to turn my audio off and rejoin, or is it on your end? I think we were fine until we started live streaming, Nancy, right? Correct. Well, hi, Brian. Hi, Brian. Can you help us? We're having an we're echo problem. Until we yeah, so, um, we were fine until we started live streaming, Nancy, right? Is that better? Okay, now, now Gamma, Gamma, if you can unmute yourself and see if we still get an echo or not. Is that better? Hi. Okay, now. Okay, I believe we're good without an echo now. Is that right? Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, you should be good to go. Can you see my slides? Yes. I, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that. I still hear an echo. Sorry. Yeah, Nancy, I think you're just going to have to stay muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> I still hear an echo. Sorry. Yeah, Nancy, I think you're just going to have to stay muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> I still hear an echo. Sorry. Okay, so can you hear me? Uh, so just give me a thumbs up if you're muted and you can still hear me and there's no echo. I guess I can check the Slack, hold on. Okay, can someone just type in the Slack that they can hear me? Okay, hello everybody, I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is Gemma White. Um, I am a speech and language pathologist um, and I work at WIHD Assistive Technology Program. And we are here to discuss where is the penis, um, equipping AAC users to discuss personal and body safety. So disclosures, I receive, I am a, um, I'm an ASHA um, American Speech and Hearing Association and Royal College, which is in the UK, speech and language pathologist. Um, over my career, I've had to report child abuse for individuals with developmental disabilities. And three years ago, I had to discuss catfishing with my older son and explore if he'd been picked as a victim by one of his teachers. So with that, I'd like to thank SAR Academy, where they go to school, Dr. Shoshana Dacus and Rachel Bauer, who's the one of the lawyers and parent for the work that they've done in developing a really robust curriculum to discuss body and health and safety. 
Um, and I'm a mom of five kids that are growing up in a very different technical age from the one that I grew up on. Um, depending on when you listen to this, I would like to have some teachers to support these lessons on um, lessons on teachers by teachers, but there yet. Um, so the learning objectives. By the end of this session, you will develop, you will understand um, why we need to add all body parts to AAC systems in the context of safety education. Be able to produce some goal-driven lessons to address safety education in AAC users and explain the relevance of teaching safety education to AAC users. So let's look at some of the stats. One in four children who identify as girls and one in 14 who identify boys experience child sexual abuse. And as you look back on those memories of childhood, 20% of adult females and five to 10% adult males recall a childhood abuse experience in the US. The most vulnerable ages between seven and 13 and with abduction still being an issue in the US. 91% of children aged 10 to 17 receive unwanted sexual solicitation online. So I found a study that interviewed specifically AAC users um, and we looked at their experience um, of crime and abuse. So 97% of those interviewed knew who the perpetrator was. Um, 71% of them shot interviewed multiple types of different victimization and only 28% had reported experiences to the police. So that's 45% of AAC users who are experiencing significant loss of property, physical harm, emotional effects. And the article ends in a policies and practice needed to change to end the silence. So with that, we have to have a robust safety education um, and provide AAC users the language that they need to address safety education, um, to develop a plan to have that language available if they might need it, as opposed to needing to formulate it when they do. We need to make sure that all relevant body parts are in the language, language are in the device. And we need to provide concepts so that students can be assertive of their own body protection and boundaries. The aim is to have users prepared and not scared and have them able to use the language that they need and without making them frightened or suspicious of their surroundings. So I really thank Dr. Shoshana because as she says, a lot of the child, child safety remains the responsibility of the adults. It is our responsibility to keep the students safe. So with that, there are often concerns about teaching safety education to students. We might be scared that an individual is going to act out. We might think that we're giving them ideas and we might think that they're going to be distrustful of adults. But all of that is unfounded and unwarranted. If we introduce safety, to safety topics to learners uh, who use AAC early, we can teach them to protect themselves, to advocate themselves, to trust themselves, and to identify helpers who they might need within their environment or people who may be perpetrating those crimes. When managed in a developmentally non-threatening way, we can teach AAC users to be better self-advocates. The, the typical abuser is not what I grew up with in the 1980s, you know, the guy in the trench coat who would come and offer you candy from the car. Um, now it's really more grooming that you have to worry about. 91% of child sex abuse, according to the CDC, is per perpetrated by somebody that the child knows. That could be a family sexual abuser or some other adult or child that is known to that individual. So for us as educators, we are mandated reporters. And within that, we have to be good listeners. The, if a child were to come to you and disclose something, the way that we treat that will have significant impact on the long-term resilience of that individual. 
And what we know about AAC users is we have to provide wait time. It often takes them a very long time to formulate what it is, especially if it's something traumatic. And so providing wait time and being a good and available listener is extremely important. Um, I'm not going to play this video for you, but I do encourage you to look it up if you don't know it. This is from Gail Van Tattenhove, and it's the power of core vocabulary. And if she hadn't given John time and space to get his message out, then his abuse would have continued. So in order for that to happen, the language has to be there. And I realized several years ago that many of the language systems that I recommend for toddlers and children don't have the words that psychologists are using in early childhood safety education. Where is the penis? After today, you're going to add it. It sort of started about two years ago. I was working on a um, one of the boards, med, um, the low-tech boards for the medical department, and I was on board maker, and I was searching for the word penis. Um, anybody who knows me knows I am very dyslexic. So I turned on to my husband and I said, "Am I spelling penis right?" He's like, "John, what are you doing?" <laughs> And I was spelling it right. It just wasn't there. And I actually posted this on Instagram and got a like by Hannah Foley. So I knew I was on the right track to something. Like, what if someone's got a UTI? So then I started delving around the common language systems, you know, the robust language systems that we frequently recommend to children. Search for the word penis, wasn't there. Search for the word vagina, wasn't there. It's okay if you've got an itchy bottom. Um, you can have that. But distinctly lacking across a number of language systems was the relevant body parts. Speak to yourself, four stars, actually two hits away, you've got penis and vagina. So um, it's not entirely absent. And there's no, I don't mean to be language, you know, bashing of any way of any particular um, system, but bliss symbols, your 3D symbols, if you wanna get into, you know, printing, um, Ken has penises ready for you. Um, and so why do we need to use real words? It's really important. You know, if the British girl can get up here and tell you that we, we can't be embarrassed, if we assign nicknames to, to the body parts, then it shows that we're embarrassed. And if there's shame attached to our body parts and we're embarrassed about talking about it, then that's what we're going to teach our kids. So we have to find a different way forward when we're taking individuals to the bathroom we need to teach them during toilet paint training, you know, wipe your vagina, put your penis away. We need to help them identify their body parts so that if something's wrong, they can say so. And God forbid there's abuse, then you're able to identify that, you know, something's wrong or something touched. Um, I was speaking to Claire Raymond from the Child Advocacy Unit um, at WID, where they often deal with abused individuals. And one of the things she noted to me was that abused children often have no names assigned to their private parts. So then I got to wonder, well, is it the app store restrictions? Is it that if we had an app, the, that would be an 18 plus. So that's why there's no vagina. But it's not the case, but the, it's not the case because the, you know, the, 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 accent, the accents, the Nova chats, the, the, these concepts are not there. And then I got to a school <laughs> and I was, uh, one of, I go to once a month and the ages is Michelle like, Gemma, you're never going to guess, you got to help me. So this kid goes into her touch chat and she goes to add a button. And she goes to symbol sticks and she goes to the adult and she is scrolling, laughing hysterically through all these pictures. So the penis is obviously there, um, which comes to the child's safety remains the responsibility of the adults programming the device. I have become known as the penis lady. Let's add in the child's name. Let's add in the child's vagina going to add it in if I have to teach you how to add in a button that's not what we're here to talk about today please go YouTube it for your particular language system they are all really editable um, having body safety discussions involves having a shared language about body safety and introducing re lessons repetitively across professionals 
um, in small moments, as Shoshana would say. Um, so interestingly, there was a, um, a study of the LEND group. LEND is the Leadership in Education Neurodevelopmental Related Disabilities. So we have a LEND site at WID. And there was a student about eight years ago, so it is a while now, who did a study on health and sex education in special ed schools in the new Westchester area. And she sent out a survey to look at who was responsible for health and safety education and when that, when that was happening. And what she found is it wasn't. Not a single school that she'd sent that survey to had a formal way of addressing health and safety education with individuals with special needs. And they sometimes didn't even have a designated individual to discuss that. They said that it was done as an as needed when basis. So that's simply not good enough, right? If these are the topics that my school has developed a sort of robust curriculum to address, right? Between ages three to five, we look at private part identification. They look at who can touch and see. A comfortable versus uncomfortable touch, surprise versus secrets, and identifying circles of trusted adults. So if that's what an early learning program looks like, like I think that we need to educate those individuals with developmental disabilities, and we are responsible for disseminating lessons, but with our own slight AAC twist. So with that, we go to what are your private parts, right? We want to connect social stories to and the anatomy on the device and the language on the device. And when I was thinking about this, you know, in order to have a gender inclusive classroom, the environment requires familiarity with an array of different gender concepts and identity. Um, and we notice, I've noticed that um, gender fluid and gender non-conforming non-binary relationships are more common in students with autism. So we need to separate very clearly gender from private parts from abuse. They are different conversations and they have to happen at different times. The private part identification focuses just on what your private parts are. So we talk about our bodies being good and special places, deserving care and respect. And when you see this pink, this is where we can really take those social stories and help us connect that language. We talk about some parts of private that no one gets to see and touch. Private parts being covered by underwear and bathing suits, people having parts that are the same and parts that are different. We talk about all people having private parts in their front and their back. The private part in the front that is outside of your body is your penis. The one inside of your body is called your vagina. Some families have different names. We address this. We talk about the fact that other families do. And private part at the back is called the bottom or the butt. And that's what we keep seeing across those language systems when I search for it. The private part on the chest is called the breast or the nipples. And I do want to draw attention to the fact that TD SNAP actually does follow this medically related terminology that I, um, I think is important for us to look at, where you have the internal versus the external body parts. And internally, you do have that vagina there. Thank you, three stars, but only three because where is my penis in my external body parts? Um, so where's the other vocabulary, right? We need to make sure that students are able to go from that home screen to that body part. We often talk about no backwards chaining. Um, I'm noticing a question, I can't multitask, I'll do them at the end. Um, no backwards chaining when it comes to AAC. Um, and so going from that home screen, making sure students can go home screen, body parts, me, body parts, off body parts, whatever your pathway is to get there, make sure that that's where you can go there. Um, and then we want to look at having concrete rules, right? Abuse prevention conversation relies around having concrete rules for our body. Like 
You are the boss of your body, right? Who is the boss of your body? You are the boss of your body. We keep our bodies healthy. We keep our bodies safe. No one gets to touch your private parts. You know, I sent my kid off to camp this morning and my oldest son laughed at me as I was changing. I was like, don't let anybody touch your penis. Uh, uh, we, and, and he was like, this is gross, mom. <laughs> But we have to talk about it. We have to tell them this. Um, we have to tell them that nobody gets to make their bodies feel unsafe. Um, who can see and touch private parts? Um, we want to provide concrete information to students about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And when we have doctors and nurses who are touching us, it's always with somebody else in the room. We need to make sure that students, you know, they have concrete ways to say no. You know, anybody can say no to touching. Don't touch a person who says no to touching. Practice saying no. Practice saying, I don't like that. And if we practice it and we formulate it in different ways, I like that. I don't like that. Okay not okay to different things so that your students know what feels good to them and what doesn't feel good to them right flexible language when it comes to this a little bit and then i want to go back to the words that the psychologists are using right when we talk about touching we talk about an okay touch or a safe touch or a comfortable touch not really good we will get into that in a little bit I do think for us, often that okay and not okay is gonna be the most concrete, but the word safe versus unsafe and comfortable versus uncomfortable are topics that we need to talk about because sometimes we like touching and sometimes we don't. Sometimes a feeling can be confusing, right? And if we provide students about rules about touching, about what feels good, you know, Touching is okay when my parents take me to bed, you know, sitting on my mommy's lap, thinking about that, and then thinking about the word safe, I realized it wasn't in touch chats. But we talk about safety concepts all the time. You know, often if a child's stimming and they're maybe going to hit themselves on something, um, then you might... Um, you might want to provide, you know, that word, like, let's be safe. Um, when you're crossing the road, we talk about safe. That's, you know, so the word safe is coming up repetitively. So I do think we can introduce it in the word, in terms of touching. Um, it's just a word you know, that we're going to have to add into some of those vocabularies. Um, and the reason that we're focusing not on the words good and bad is because often those touches are confusing, right? An inappropriate or an unsafe touch registers as confusing. And we need kids to be clear about the different types of touching, you know? An unsafe touch can be someone touching you or you touching someone else. Um, it can hurt your mind or it can hurt your body. And it can not just be touching with your hands, but touching with any parts of your body. Um, and the reason, like I said, it's safe versus unsafe is because sometimes it's physiologically very um, confusing, right? Uh, maybe you ejaculated, maybe the feeling wasn't actually physically uncomfortable and you weren't in pain, but you know that something was wrong. And we speak about tricky behaviors as opposed to the person. And we'll get into that in a little bit as well. But so the words of safe versus not safe, or in terms of this little girl, she's using Unity 45. Um, and maybe I really shouldn't have been using the word, you know, bad, but we were talking about like, if there was something that she doesn't like, we were doing it's bad, it's okay, you know, goodbye. Like when something's bad and you tell me it's bad, it, it goes away. So I was trying to solidify those concepts for her. Um, and have her practice, you know, preference language. So like a hug is not okay today. Um, we need to normalize talking about body safety and think about abuse discussions as prevention. 
like safety is teaching kids to tell us when there's something wrong. So let's go back to another rule they have in my kids' school. They talk about no run tell. So if something happens to you, it's never okay to someone touch your private parts or touch your body. And if somebody tries, you say no, you run away and you tell somebody. So we can provide examples of what those are. You know, nobody touches your private parts. Nobody makes you feel uncomfortable. But we are often dealing with individuals with mobility challenges and recall challenges. It makes that telling really hard. So we need to be sensitive. We need to ask our kids, you know, how did you feel when you were handled by your carer? Often you've got, you know, children who are well beyond the age of three or four where typically they're having help in the bathroom who still continues to need assistance. Like I always make sure that you're asking permission before you touch that individual. You no, know? like even if you think that person doesn't cognitively understand you, you know, is it, is it okay? You know, we're going to wipe you now. We're going to wipe your vagina. We're going to keep your vagina nice and clean. Um, developing that dialogue so that students know that if somebody ever feels uncomfortable, there's a way to address it in the language. And we're modeling that and we're providing best practice in our AAC systems, the language will be there through those lesson plans. So then we go with the but. If somebody didn't say no, if something happened to an individual being available, making them aware that unsafe things can happen, as we know, 45% of AAC users are subject to something. Come and tell us. You can talk to us. Things are going to be okay. And that's where we focus on the behaviors and not the people. Finding the word safe within those language systems, making sure that we have concepts that we need to be discussing, that we need available across environments and across educators. So the next concept that we address and the language we need available for is a surprise versus a secret, right? The difference between a surprise versus a secret, nobody gets to keep secrets from, you know, you don't keep secrets from your trusted adults. You want to understand that a surprise is different. A surprise you keep secret you know you keep quiet about for just a little bit of time um, but secrets are something that you don't ever tell anybody and we need to understand why this is important because if we understand grooming we understand who's going to engage in grooming right that these are not scary individuals these are people who are in the individual's life singling out a couple of children sharing inappropriate information sharing secrets with our individuals gaining their trust through you know what feels like privileged information pushing down boundaries boundaries gradually so as educators we need to understand what the red flags of grooming are so that we can provide children with language and rules that are going to prevent sexual abuse. One of the things that was noted to me again by Claire from the Child Advocacy Unit was that it's not always an adult. It's often child on child touching with individuals with developmental disabilities. It's not uncommon for them to be left in the care of the very same age individuals. So a 16 year old with a 21 year old can be problematic. And it is secrets that are used in grooming. So we need to make sure kids realize that nobody should be asking you to keep a secret from your parent, from your trusted adult. And that's language that we build up over time, right? Secrets have an ending. Um, sorry, <laughs> secrets surprise ending whereas secrets don't and we don't keep those secrets like if we're doing like a mother's day surprise we can you know we can say that we're going to keep this a surprise for a little bit this is a surprise for your mummy we're not keeping secrets from our mummies um and most importantly it's never okay to keep secrets about touching and if somebody tells you that we're going to tell we're going to tell somebody right away, right? Touching is never a secret. 
And then I started looking for the word secret. Where was that located in the different language systems? And those concepts are there and surprise, you know, let's make a surprise for somebody. It's their birthday surprise. But the game, touching is never a game. Talking about private parts is never a game. We never play the type private part game. Um, being aware of what makes you uncomfortable and being aware of those like common triggers. So when it comes to the body safety, no secrets, especially any touching involving children is for the whole world to see. And with that, we identify a circle of trusted adults. Um, we want students to name three to four adults who they can tell you about, who they can tell things to do, who, are, who they can go to with problems. We also need to make sure that all of the language systems have all of the students in there. I mean, I often get things where people say like, oh, we don't have clearance for, or the adults are not happy with the pictures being taken. That doesn't matter. Ways around that, you know, say Joe like wears dangly earrings. So you have a picture of an earring, you know, Brian's always playing with cars. You put a picture of a car. There are ways in there where the language has to be there to support identification of personal people and team members and encourage them to add real photos and to, to get the disclosures from the team. Now, I, I have a very standard letter that I provide to teachers all the time to get, you know, explaining why you would want that student's peer in the communication device, why you need all the aids in the communication device. And then, you know, the personal safety topics, can they state their first and last name? You know, what's your name? What's your first name? What's your last name? Can you state your caregiver's name? In order for that to happen, the language has to be there. It's no point waiting for the AAC expert to come in and program those devices, right? You have to teach us, teach the teachers to do that, teach the parents to do that. So that all of the people who can be there to help or potential abusers are in there for the child to name. In order to make it editable, you know, make sure that there's the pathways are there, that it's obvious. Like the most successful users that I see are the ones where there's a ton of personalization, right? Where you've gone to this when protocol here, you've gone to this about me and it's got the picture of the user, it's got the individual there. And then we want to think about safety helpers. Who do I go for if I need help? And what's the language that I use if I need help, right? Who do I go to when I'm lost? We talk about safe helpers, that word safe coming up again. Um, who can be those safe helpers? Cashiers, policemen, um, often in public, you can go to a, a, a mother with children. Um, do we go with them? Do we leave with them? If I, the answer is no. I stay where I am and I look for the person who I was lost from. The other part that I think is important is that often multimodal AAC users, they'll often use ID bracelets. So, you know, someone says to you, what's your name? Maybe you don't have that AAC system with you. You have another way to indicate that there's, there's a way to, to, in, to, to identify who I am. So I guess the long-term goal is to be able to call 911. Um, we had a bit of an incident here on Mother's Day where not, somebody fell out of a car and maybe needed a stitches or two. And during the, um, the kerfuffle, I told my oldest, I'm like, call Hatzala, which is the Jewish ambulance service. And, you know, he was, he's a, high schooler with a 4.0 average right now and he could not figure out what to say he could figure out the number you know that was in his phone but he didn't know what to say he, he was completely stuck so we need to role play with somebody anybody in that you know in those situations what are the words that we say i'm hurt i'm sick there's a fire Think about what's your address, you know, how do you find your address and then teach them rules, you know, don't hang up because then that way the emergency services can come and find you. And something that I've noticed in my practice is the ability to respond to 
personal questions, right? Uh, to, 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 to flexible questions. So when you say to somebody like, where do you live? They might answer it one way. But if I said to that user, you know, what's your address? They've never practiced responding to that question. So they have no idea to say, what's your address? So practice answering and asking and answering those questions differently, having all of the information, identifying community helpers, safe helpers, who do I go to, you know, if I get lost, providing children with specific rules about going with individuals um, and really providing them the language and the rules to, to be prepared um, and not scared. And we want to do that, you know, often we have very strong compliance-based programs. Um, we need to teach safety rules and body safety with personal advocacy in mind. Um, these are just some basic tips that you can look at later for that age. And then I wanna move on to high school age individuals because there's a whole scary world out there for teens and tweens. And they, we are putting hands in their hands, very powerful systems and opening them up to um, a world of technology. We have to give them information about the harassment and the cyberbullying that they may, be, they may experience and what sexual harassment online looks like. Um, we want to role play different ways that that, um, that, that that sexual harassment you know, might need to be reported and understand, help students understand what constitutes sexual harassment in that middle and high school age, reviewing with them anti-bullying you know, anti policies. Because when it comes to things like sexting, kids have a very different outlook to us. If you look at the Journal of American Pediatrics for 2018, this is shocking. 17 to 7, 12 to 17 year olds, one in four are receiving and one in seven are sending nude texts of themselves. It's even higher according to the parenting app, which is a little bit later, where you have one in four who are sending and receiving. This is child pornography. It is illegal and there are long-term consequences that these children have no idea about. And we have had to you know, address situations in high school where there have been photographs taken in bathrooms. It's always the bathroom, right? Um, and there are all sorts of apps that, show that, that, are, that are known places for sexual predators. And there's a whole language out there that we have to be aware of. You know, the word spilling, spill, right? It comes from spill the tea, which is where like, you might be like, it's a confession, right? Lots of confessionals happening online because people feel very anonymous. A ship, my husband thought he was cool until I was practicing this presentation with him, right? You want to share? He's like, sure, <laughs> love to. We want to get together. We need to add the language that's relevant to teens into the language systems and then provide them with the language to be able to say no to it. Um, Cyberbullying is a whole thing and I'm not gonna get into that now, but we need to be discussing online etiquette, um, discussing safety. Um, we are exposing individuals who are quite vulnerable and need protection to an entire world out there by providing them with, you know, we talk, I've heard lots of people like guided access, it's the least restrictive environment, okay? Like it's not, we, we don't want guided access because it's not the least restrictive environment. Like, well, well, what are we opening them up to if we're not properly protecting those students? Um, nudes are commonplace. We need to see students to say no, to say, understand why they're being asked to send nudes of themselves and why they might want to, and then explore how we're going to say no, right? It's not good enough that my friend did it. It's not good enough that my friend asks. We have to specifically provide them with the understanding that nude pictures are not okay. And sometimes sextortion happens, right? I thank Rachel Ballard, the lawyer, for helping me understand this. You know, people send altered photos. So if you're posting pictures of yourself on social media and putting that picture out there, somebody can alter it and make you look naked. And then you have catfishing going on. Um, and this children eight years old and younger are, are being exposed to this. Um, 
you know, predators gain lots of information from our social media. Um, and if this happens to you, or if this happens to a student, we need to find ways to tell law enforcement. So I've provided in here, you know, some ideas for safety tech tips for early learners, looking at like the YouTube controls. Um, ask first is something that school have developed, which is something that at home I really try to push with my own kids. Like before you go on the internet, you need to ask mommy first, right? Um, having rules about FaceTime and Zoom and nudity, even if it's your own family. Um, asking permission, even students' permission before posting. Um, and really, when there's something that's scary or inappropriate online, making sure students identify that and that they close it and they come to you. Now, in order for all that to happen, the language has to be there, right? You have to say, I don't want to be naked. It's not safe. Um, and one of the resources that I found is this. It's from a, um, a group called Sacred Spaces. Um, they're actually a cross-denominational Jewish initiative that looked um, came about in order to address sexual abuse and other abuses of power in Jewish institutions across North America. Um, and I, th that I think that they're really the concepts can be relevant to all organizations, but having concrete rules, not just for the young individuals, but for your organization, um, having conduct guidelines, appropriate screenings, and making sure that your space is safe is, an, is really an important um, thing to, to, you know, to consider, like it comes from the top down. Um, talking about things in small moments with a shared language, adding all language related to safety education to the AAC system, right? That language has to be there. The people, the body carts, the media icons, where is the penis? If you looked at my photo roll right now, I'm probably violating the acceptable use policy that just got sent out by my work because this is what my photo looks like. The penis is there, okay? You have to go away, you have to search for him and you have to add it. Um, I'm also going to give you some resources I came out about, um, about speak up and be safe from the US, the child advocacy looked at lots of apps to do with anatomical dolls, um, things that you should do if a child discloses to you, um, some references, and does anybody have any comments, questions, I guess I can look at this chat now, I really, I can't, like I said, I'm just like, like I can't multitask and read, so I'm going to appear over here, and Nancy, if you can unmute without a crazy echo, I guess, yes, do that. I, I did. Thank you, Chema. This is an amazing conversation. And the comments show how critical this topic is and how much it needs to be addressed. Some of the questions, I'll try to summarize a little bit. The first one had to do with overcoming some of the barriers that you might encounter with policies um, in, in terms of when you want to introduce these concepts with parents and school boards and governments, how how do you address it when they don't think it's appropriate, when there's either conservative ideas or religious aspects? Is, are there strategies? You just mentioned one, but... Um, I mean, I really think throwing the figures at them is the best thing to do. If we look at the figures and the stats at the number of children that are being abused, um, we have to realize there's probably somebody in our classroom or somebody in our school, and therefore, it cannot be ignored. Thank you. I'll see if there's an additional comment about that. Um, that was from Donna Moser. Another couple of questions, actually a series of questions had to do with children who might uh, say no if you're asking to give them help to go to the bathroom and they say no, but they still need that help. How, do you, how would you address that? And several people said that comes up frequently in their practice. I think that the, having the discussion and having the negotiation about why that's important um, and having that other user, having another person in the room, you know, having another person there, if a child is yelling and shouting, no, um, there needs to be, you know, the social story to support why I'm taking to the bathroom, often broken down. Um, we need to be clean this is the person who's going to help me. These are the steps involved. So providing some visual support and visual 
um, steps as to what's happening and then acknowledging that this may be uncomfortable um, and then acknowledging why we have to do that, um, I think is, provides logical negotiation. Really helpful strategies. Um, and, and related to that, uh, Bridget Kavanaugh asked, if a student can't consent or cannot give consent verbally or non-verbally, what are some ways that you might indicate choice? I mean, I think that's a whole huge IAC yeah. discussion. Yeah, but I, that's, that's a whole I, other area. I think that what it comes down to is actually ask, asking those questions, right? Even if you think that user doesn't understand or can't consent, you know, if you have to wipe them because they're filthy right now, then you're going to say like, I'm going to wipe you. You're really dirty. I hope that's okay. And then, you know, talking them through, like I think, you know, we talk when you go to a hospital, like nurses will always talk you through your procedures. So talking them through precisely what you're doing at what point can be um, more empowering for them. That's great. Thank you. Uh, there was a question about, an additional question about parent training. How would you include this material in parent training if that's something that you've addressed or thought about? Yeah, I mean, I, I generally do it in the context of when I'm adding the vocabulary. If I'm doing it, you know, uh, I'll explain to the parent, you know, that the, all the body parts are in, your, in the language system. We want to make sure that the student has access to all of those body parts. And just, we, we have, look, if, 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 the, if I can get a parent talk about it, you can talk about it too. Like, we have to be open about what it is that we're doing. There's nothing shameful about this. Like these are our body parts. So just opening this conversation like you have with us is a really wonderful opportunity for all of us. And there is a request for your materials and they are online with, uh, if you click on the link that uh, Melissa provided in the, ch in the Slack chat. And people can always email me. If you've got any questions, email me. You'll, you'll see my little Waldo dildo on Instagram. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This is a, an amazing resource and opening up a whole new avenue of, of consideration. Thanks. So our session is now finished. <laughs>